pa pi pi pom pi 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 pom pi pa pa pom pa pi pi pom pa pi pi pom pi pa pa pom pa 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 pi pi pom pi 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 pom pi pa pa pom pa pi pi pom pa pi pi pom pi pa pa pom pa 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 Ecology is the study of the interactions of organisms with each other and their environment. So ecology might look at how cold-tolerant plants are found in higher latitudes. Well, except those found on mountains at high altitudes. Or uh, ecologists might look at how plants survive by using solar radiation to keep them warm enough to reproduce. Well, except those that use metabolic heat to warm their seeds. Uh, or ecologists might look at how those plants in that family have a random distribution because the seeds are distributed by the wind, uh, except for the one species that is clumped because mice cache them around their nest. Hmm, this ecology stuff seems to be just a collection of separate examples. Or so you might think. Let's look again at the definition of ecology. Because there are different ways to organize organisms in their environment, there are many different levels incorporated into this definition. You might study how individuals are adapted to the environments like fluting in the desert cacti that allow the plant to expand to take in and store water in rare rain events. You could also look at how populations of the same species interact, like where these water voles choose to nest. They actually decide on sites that are close to other members of their species but not close to high density areas. An even broader view might incorporate how multiple species interact. For instance, predator-prey interactions and how predator populations may be determined based on the number in the prey population, such as this example of the lynx and hare. Layering another factor over these, you could look at how abiotic factors in an ecosystem affect location of plants and the cascading effects the plants have on higher trophic levels. Then, if you looked at multiple ecosystems, you might see patches in the landscape or large-scale features that create effects on the organisms living on it. For example, the physical layout of islands or mountains may limit the number and types of species found on them. So ecology, because it is the interaction between organisms and their environment, can range from the individual through connections between ecosystems. However, there is another dimension in the definition of ecology. Interactions don't have a specified time. So the relationships between two organisms may have dynamics that occur on the scale of seconds, days, years, decades, or millennia. For instance, if we look at the relationship between gypsy moth and an oak tree, it has a short-term relationship with the tree in that the larva will migrate to the top of the tree during the day and to the bottom of the tree at night. It has longer population dynamics where the female will lay her roughly 200 eggs on the side of the tree. If the population density per tree gets too high, the larva will balloon or send a silk thread up to catch an air current to transport them to better habitat. It also has an evolutionary relationship with the tree where the tree has adaptations to reduce herbivory, such as tannins in the leaves, and the larva has adaptations, such as preferring young leaves that lack the defensive chemical. Having two variables for how to think about ecology gives us a grid as a way to think about and arrange ecological concepts. For example, if you were interested in an invasive species, you might record its daily migratory patterns, which might be measurements of individuals, or population dynamics, such as growth rates. Is it growing exponentially or logistically? Which could fit in days to years, depending on the species? What types of interspecific relationships does it create? Will this likely lead to competitive exclusion of another species? Can you think of a process or concept for each of these boxes? Ba, be, be, bon, be, 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 bon, be, ba, ba, bon. This grid is helpful in arranging ecological concepts, but it also may help when designing a research question. 
Let's see how some research might fit into this system. Let's take two researchers. Since we already have our organisms from the last act, let's look at two researchers who look at gypsy moth dynamics, Joe Elkington and Greg Dwyer. If you look at Elkington's research, he has done studies measuring gypsy moth populations over a season, measuring densities of different life stages during an outbreak, as well as looking at effects over a few years and maternal effects, seeing if the quantity of food females consume affects their offspring's viability. And finally, in an impressive 14-year study, Elkington collected data on gypsy moth mortality deer mice, and acorn production. The data imply that population dynamics of gypsy moths were most affected at low densities by deer mice, and the number of deer mice was determined by the number of acorns, which are one of the mice's main food sources. So in years of low acorns, the mice population declines the following year, and there are fewer mice to eat gypsy moth pupae. So a bad year in acorns may actually allow gypsy moths to reach outbreak populations. Dwyer has used mathematical models to examine gypsy moth dynamics, and much of his research has fleshed out details of scale. Some of Dwyer's work includes looking at how populations of gypsy moth emerge synchronously over large distances. He's also looked into community levels with modeling the interaction between gypsy moths, their predators, and pathogens. He shows that outbreak populations in the moth can be explained by incorporating a random component in traditional predator-prey and host pathogen models. He has also looked at landscape ecology levels by looking at spatial scale and the effect it has on transmission of fungal disease of gypsy moths. The combination of these boxes helps to give the specifics of the story. So for Dwyer's model on the effect of spatial scale, it was important for him to know Elkington's work on the relationship between number of eggs laid and how many of those reach reproductive age. And Dwyer's model, looking at why gypsy moths might disperse, may be used by Elkington to explain patterns that he measures. So if you were interested in researching another aspect of the system, you might choose to study the community at a shorter time interval. You might be interested in the relationship between predator and diseased prey. Do mouse predators avoid gypsy moths infected by the virus? You would then draw heavily on the work that has previously been done, and similarly, if you were interested in the dynamics of zebras, lions, and zebra pathogens, you might draw on the models by Dwyer. However, the population dynamics might be different, or the individual differences between insect and mammal might create a different scenario and in the process create a different puzzle. Some people view biology as just a bunch of stories, each distinct, with few connections. Instead of seeing it as a group of interconnected concepts that combine to make new puzzles. Each species natural history is a special combination of these concepts and as the grid shows questions put into any box are affected by the concepts in the other boxes. Even though they are unique they all rely on similar mechanisms and interactions. Understanding what the interactions are and how they might influence different levels of organization such as the individual, population, community, or ecosystem, or how these influences develop over time allows you to put your ecological question into a framework and help shape your hypotheses. This has been a Paper Pushers production.